I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. Raised in Maryland near the Aberdeen Proving Ground where military machines are tested, Cal Ripken Jr. proved as durable as a Sherman tank. For more than 16 years, the Oriole infielder started every game, covering more track than a man known as the Iron Horse, and sometimes he did it with admirable recklessness. And Bill Hasselman comes up for the third time with two outs, nobody on in the seventh. Oh, oh, here we go. Hasselman charging the mound. He and Messina got after it. Tackett dives in. And it all fetches him empty. That fight with Seattle had been one of the more ugly baseball brawls you'll ever see. It broke out about three different times. It went on for about 25 minutes. It was nasty. Cal came in there to protect Mike, and by doing that, he got clipped from the Seattle dugout. I mean, his knee was, was totally destroyed. The next morning I woke up, and I thought for a second, I said, there's no way I could play with this. Um, I can't even move. I can't even walk to the kitchen. The next day in the clubhouse, another reporter and I agreed, let's just check on the major players, make sure they're okay. Well, the one guy we didn't check on, because who needs to check on him, is Cal Ripken. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and say that somewhere along that line, later that evening, you know, when it was a question of him playing, there was a sort of pressure. What do we do? Is the streak a factor? I remember having a conversation with my wife, and I think she said something like, well, do you think you can just play an inning and then come out? I said, you too? Everyone was so into the streak for the sake of the streak, and to me, it was never about that. It was just about playing. I go to Cal, maybe half hour before the game, just before they throw us out of the locker room, and said, I, I just can't believe that the way Basio clipped you, that, that you're okay. And then he told me the whole story. When he came to the ballpark, he told the manager that he was out, the streak was over, take me out of the lineup. And only about an hour before the game, he tried to work the, the soreness and stiffness out of his knee and discovered that he, he actually could play. So, in June of 1993, more than two years before he would exercise the ghost of Lou Gehrig, Cal Ripken Jr. started his 1,791st consecutive game, a march of endurance that began on May 30th, 1982. Three days after suffering that injury, he demonstrated that his focus was not so much on the future, but the moment. Game in Baltimore against the Oakland days. Oakland days pitcher hits Ripken up high and hard. The next batter advances Cal to second, and the next batter hits a single right, and around third comes Cal. Cal Ripken heading home. The throw by Sierra. And Cal falls over the catcher, but he's out. I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, Cal, why are you doing this? I mean, you're, you know, getting close to, you know, doing that record, and and you know, the catcher, we got all our gear on. You know, you're you're kind of going to be the one that that has a chance to possibly get hurt. Steinbeck's out of the game. That's how hard they hit. It wasn't luck. It wasn't that Cal Ripken didn't get hurt. He was hurt all the time. Like the Iron Horse, whose record of 2,130 consecutive games he chased, Ripken played with pain as though it were a childhood friend. He was cut from the same rock from which his father was made. Want to know the mentality that produced the streak in the sun? It was in the father. Cal Ripken Sr. was a drill sergeant, a Marine Corps drill sergeant in effect in baseball. He smoked Lucky Strikes and he drank Schlitz beer, and the Lucky Strikes weren't filtered, and the Schlitz beer wasn't Schlitz light. He would light up a cigarette, and by the time he was through with you, it had burned itself down to where it was at his fingertips. I saw a cigarette go out in his hands, but he would never let you know that it was bothering or that it was there, because he had a point he had to make, and he was teaching baseball. His father was a great soccer player. Cal Sr. would come home from a soccer game and have those terrible blood blisters under his big toe. And Cal Jr. said that Sr. would take out a power drill and drill a little hole in his toenail and the blood would come spurting out and Sr. would go, ah, like that. He would stake out his garden for, for days waiting for the groundhog who ate his, his watermelon crop and, and then just You'd hear one shotgun blast where he would just, you know, he would take out the groundhog. We were shoveling snow. There was a specific way you did it. And if you weren't going to do it the right way, you might as well go back in the house or you might as well go somewhere else. 
Americans were always going somewhere else. Born on August 24, 1960, to Cal and Vi Ripken in Havita Grace, Maryland, Cal Jr., with his three siblings, grew up in the moving shadow of their militaristic father as he toured the minors, changing teams almost annually. His parents, the first 20 years they were married, moved to 15 different towns. The six of them formed a unit that was us against the world. They had their own games. Everything was those six people. Rochester, New York, there used to be a Saturday morning camp. He would come tap me early in the Saturday morning. He would kind of shake your knee, and everybody else would be sleeping. And he'd say, you want to come with me today? And the answer really inside was no. But uh, I jumped up and got dressed and jumped in the car with him. That was a special 20 minutes. It was my opportunity to be with him by myself. The traveling around from ballpark to ballpark, uh, all, all of our kids adjusted very well to that. I think they thought that was a normal way of living. And because baseball was the occupation, so to speak, it was also a preoccupation. Cal Ripken, more than anyone, probably in baseball history, was marinated from infancy in the baseball culture. He always wanted to be out on the field. Uh, Dad had to constantly push him back a couple of those years because he kept creeping in from the outfield during batting practice and tried to stand in the infield. And he'd have to turn around and yell at him, say, get back out there. His dad had basically said, uh, if you're going to be an infielder, you go take ground balls behind Doug. And so we'd alternate taking ground balls to second base, and I'd kind of pass on some of the information that I knew to him. He probably would go back to his dad and verify whether that was correct or not. I don't think even today that he wants to do anything that he thinks would disappoint his dad. Two strikes a cat. And a broken bat ground ball, backhanded by Ripken, a fine play and a good arm, and there you see why he's regarded as possibly the best talent in the International League. Although unimpressive when he was brought up by the Orioles late in the strike-shortened season of 1981, Ripken increasingly felt the pressure to fulfill others' expectations the following spring. After 18 games, he was batting 117. He was just going through hell, uh, everybody trying to tell him what to do. And one night, Reggie Jackson gets a hit and comes steaming in the third, and he says, listen, Cal, I want to talk to you. He had known Reggie when Cal was 15 years old, and Reggie was with the Orioles. And Re Reggie said, listen, Cal, the Orioles traded away a tremendous player, Doug DeCensis, so you could play in his place. Quit trying to do things that you can't do. Do the things you can do. You're going to be great. Quit worrying about it. And Cal told me that that was the best advice he ever got. Doing what he did best, Ripken finished the season with a 264 average and led all rookies with 28 homers and 93 RBIs. But more than the numbers, it was his passion for the game that impressed his teammates. He would ask a thousand questions. Why is Billy Martin doing that? Why is, why is he throwing a 2-2 curveball? Why do you think Belanger's or whoever's playing in the hole? And he had this incredible amount of energy, and we said to Earl, will you please keep him in the lineup because he's, he's driving us crazy. You see him coming sometime, he'll just bow your head and just hope he'll go by, or, you know, he'll come over and he'll hit you wanting to wrestle you, and the best thing to do was no reaction at times, and, you know, he'll move on to the next person. Ripken's gung-ho spirit moved manager Earl Weaver to defy tradition by switching the six-foot-four RBI man from third to a position normally filled by smaller, lighter-hitting players. I decided that, uh, okay, I've watched Ripken play shortstop. He's the guy I want the ball hit to in the bottom of the ninth to win the game. I'm going to put him there, and I'm going to play him there until I satisfy myself that he can't do it. The organization thought I was nuts. As soon as he moved to shortstop in the middle of his first season, um, he was a team leader, he was a complete player, he ran the infield. The liner and the Orioles are the world champions. Playing every inning of every game in 1983, Weaver's field commander led the majors with 211 hits and the Orioles to victory over the Phillies in the World Series. In just two full seasons, he had established himself as a bona fide star. 
Cal told me at the end of the 1983 season, I was asking him, he'd been rookie of the year his first year and most valuable player his second year. And I said, what are your goals? And he said, I want to be like Brooks Robinson and Pete Rose. I want to play every inning of every game every day for 20 years. Plan in Oakland. Cal's hitting off a tee. Dead tee, flat footed, no stride, and I mean he is rocking the seats. Strong as an ox. Cal set the standard for big shortstops. You know, in the past, shortstop has primarily been a defensive position, and it's been a position where you didn't have to hit. He is 6'4, he's a power hitter, he's hitting all these home runs, he's hitting for average, plus he's playing great defense. The 1 1 delivery to Cal. Swing a long play ball. Well hit the left field. If it's there, it's gone. Number 400 for Redskins. That power, combined with an undying passion, enabled Cal Ripken to join Carl Yastrzemski as the only American League players ever to collect 3,000 hits and 400 homers. Winner of two gold gloves in his 21 seasons, Ripken's defense has been cast in the shadow of his bat. I think he has been underrated as a fielder. Cal's uniform doesn't get dirty all that much at shortstop, but there's a reason for that. There's scores of hitters who've gone back to the dugout shaking their head because Cal was in a position they never figured he would be in. On one occasion where um, a ball got by him, it had never happened to me before and it has never happened to me since. Uh, when coming off the field, he apologized to me. He said, I'm sorry, I should have had that ball. I was out of position. You wonder, how did he know that that guy was going to hit the ball up the middle? Well, he knows everything. He scouts everybody, he keeps it all up here. I was in his gym doing a story on him. And he was playing one-on-one -on -one with his wife. He would say, watch, when she gets the ball here, she always fakes to her right. As this game's going on, then she goes to her left and shoots. And of course, she fakes to her right, she goes to her left, and she shoots. And he goes, see, he even had a scouting report on his wife. Oh, now you're 0 for 1. Mommy's 0 for 3. You're 1 for 2. You have 50%. Mommy is 0 for 4. In 1995, when Phil Regan was manager, the scouts would get the scouting reports of opposing teams. Then they would take that information and bounce it off Cal to see if it was right. Ripken's take charge nature sometimes overreached his authority. I said, Cal needs some help. And uh, he, I told him what I needed. And uh, he made the suggestion of uh, calling the pitches from shortstop. So he called every single pitch from shortstop on that particular night and I threw a complete game and won the game. I think I only gave up one or two runs. Phil Regan is in his only year as Orioles manager and two months into his tenure he's upset with some of the pitch calling of Chris Hoyles and he calls Hoyles into his office and he's and he asks him about different pitches and Hoyles looks at him and says, well I didn't call that pitch, Cal called the pitch and Phil called Cal in and Cal was very uh, indignant about it and very quite defiant and this is well this is the way we've done things. Our pitching coach, every time he go to the mound, he'd say to the pitchers, use all your pitches. And uh, finally, after he walked off, Cal calls Chris Hoyles up. He calls me up there, and Ben McDonald's pitching. He goes, I'm calling the pitches. Fastball, curveball, split. Somebody's got to make a decision right here. And he walked back short. People have accused him of going too far by calling pitches, but I think the people who play with him appreciate him for that fact. That he is a coach on the field, a manager on the field. It's sharply in the hole, a diving stop by Cal from his knees. Got it. Oh, my. In 1990, Ripken set a record for shortstops by making just three errors in 680 chances, but ran second to Ozzie Guillen for the Gold Glove Award. If he was feeling at home at short, Ripken was restless in the batter's box. 2,130, that's the number of consecutive games Lou Gehrig played and the number of stances Cal Ripken will have had in his career. For me, he, he will be remembered for changing his stance every two to three times he went up to the plate and, uh, and still made it work. He's changed stances from pitch to pitch and from inning to inning. He's tried everything and I think that is the snapshot of Cal Ripken's baseball mind. He is a self-made player. He doesn't have Rafael Palmero's swing. He doesn't have Tony Gwynn's hands. He doesn't have the batting eye of Wade Boggs. He's going to have some bad years. He's going to hit 250 sometimes.
Cal was very aware of what was being said about him, and he always was wondering, hey, is this the right thing? Should I keep playing, or am I losing my perspective here? Before this all got started with the talk of Garrick, he played not only every game in a row, but every inning of every game in a row. When we go to a new city, there started to become sort of an infatuation with this not missing an inning. So that became an area of interest. And I think my dad saw that as maybe a distraction. It came to a point in 1987 where people were really starting to question whether that made any sense at all. In mid-September, an 18-3 pounding in Toronto provided Cal Ripken Sr. an airtight case for parental intervention. I was grabbing his glove and his hat to take it out to him, and Sr. goes, ah, he's not in there, he's coming out. Is it, there's Ripken with uh, Mike Boddicker uh, sitting it out for the first time after 8,000. It just didn't feel right, I mean, sitting on the bench watching one inning. I remember playing second base in the old exhibition stadium, looking into the dugout, and he just had this complete blank stare, and he was lost. And it was so strange and so eerie that night, and I, I was wide awake and I was just thinking about things. In some ways, it felt like I had compromised my principles in a way, that you go out there and play and, and that you surrender. With the record inning streak over at 8,243, Gehrig's consecutive game record was a blip on the horizon, eight seasons away. If you look at baseball books published even in 1989, 90, even 91, there are still references to a streak that will never be broken. Even at that point, it was assumed Cal Ripken could never keep going. They had come off a horrible 1988 season, had a great 1989 inspiring season where they came up a weekend short of uh, winning the American League East title. Cal had a bad September. And in 1990, he had a, a very so-so September, which raised questions about whether the streak was wearing him out. Well, once again, Ripken will lead Major League shortstops in home runs and RBIs for the sixth time in the last seven years, despite his slump. Cal kind of dismissed all that by being the MVP in 1991, and that pretty much ended that talk for a while. A lot of people were attacking him on radio talk shows and in newspapers. Give it up, Cal. 1,100 games is enough. Jesus, you're hurting the team because he'd be hitting 260 instead of 290. Was it the best thing for him? Was it the best thing for the Orioles? Did it put managers in very difficult situations? Of course it did. I think that maybe an occasional day off might have helped him, uh, you know, get away and, and be able to step away. But the fact that he did it is amazing. I did a story on him. He says, you want to know about me? One day my dad was blowing, using a snowblower to remove some snow. And the crank on the snowblower blew off and hit him in the head, opened up a four-inch glass, bleeding everywhere. And I said, Dad, Dad, we, we got to take you to the hospital. We got to take you to the hospital. And my dad had an oily rag up against his head. He says, no, we don't. What we have to do is get me a butterfly bandage. Got the butterfly bandage, slapped it against his head, went back out, blew off the rest of the snow. That'll tell you about my father. That'll tell you about me. Stubbornness is a central Ripken streak. They react against pressure. And if you press them to do anything, they will say, no, I'm not going to do it. And so the more people pressed Cal to stop the streak, the more that Ripken stubbornness came up. I don't think stubborn is a negative trait. It's not compromising your values or your principles. It's not that you were unyielding or you didn't bend or you didn't listen. It was just when you believed something, you went for it. It bothered Cal for a long time that the streak got so much attention. And he resisted the streak for years, didn't want to be defined by it, maybe resented it to some degree. It didn't start out to be important to me. Uh, and then uh, it's escalated into something that uh, I'm almost trapped in it in the situation. That's right. People will make it more important for you than maybe it would ever have been for you. Yeah, Kirby kind of, Kirby Puckett sums it up. Uh, he says, uh, you're a prisoner of the streak. Yeah. He says, you can't take a day off even if you want to at this point. Sports Illustrated was following him, and that had become quite a distraction, uh, not only to him, but to the ball club. And Cal come up and he said, you know, I, I want your opinion. Said, I'm thinking about taking tomorrow off. I said, you're not going to take a day off when I'm pitching. And he said, no, I'm serious. He said, this is starting to bother me. If the streak weighed on Ripken's mind, he wasn't criticized for compromising its integrity. Not even the legendary Iron Horse could claim that. Lou Gehrig was obsessed with the streak. 
And he did things during the streak to keep it going that were quote unquote artificial. He led off and took one at bat in the first inning and then walked off the field just so that he could rest his back and keep the streak alive. Cal never did that once. I've never seen anybody work out after the game every day. Once that game's over, it's like a deep breath. Whew, okay, let me sit in the shower, the hot tub, or do whatever I want to do, and now I'm gone. Not Cal, there's times that the bus would have to wait on him, you know, because he would work out on the road after games. He had an 0 for 4, and he created an error one day at home. I was hanging around, I did the interviews, and I just happened to see him on the treadmill. And, and uh, you know, I thought, I'm just going to see what he does. I'm going to see what a, a Cal Ripken Jr. workout is, is all about. And I sat there and had a couple of beers and watched him run for an hour and a half. And when he got off the treadmill, I said, what was that all about? He said, that's to make sure that what happened today doesn't happen again. Play years before his crowning achievement, Ripken's pearly white consumer appeal was carved with a precision not seen since Mr. Coffee himself. I've always thought that Cal was extremely, uh, uh, very keenly aware of his own, uh, his own image to the point that when I hear stories about Joe DiMaggio uh, being captivated by his own image and being so beholden to maintaining his own image that he boxed out so, other, so many other parts of his life, I don't think he enjoyed the game as much as he did uh, before that. One of the things that DiMaggio and Ripken had in common was that they put importance upon their every act. There was never a night when Cal would not show up looking perfectly ready to play. It's not by accident that the first three letters of the word calculating are C-A-L. Nobody knows his image. Nobody protects his image and nobody takes better advantage of his image than Cal Ripken does. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. His program of controlling his image is much more like a political candidate than like any other ball player. Cal doesn't answer every question you put to him. Cal isn't interested in helping you make a good article. Cal's interested in helping you make a good picture of Cal. I've always found him to be one of the most thoughtful people in baseball. And there's many times I've asked Cal questions, and he says, you know what, I'm going to think about that, and I'm going to get back to you. His image is very important to him, and I think more athletes should be concerned about their image. More athletes should probably think before they speak, rather than just blurting out the first thing. There's no question that he's in charge of his image. When Cal was coming up in 82 and 83, um, he was a much looser, more happy-go-lucky guy than he is now. He really is aware of what he means to this community in Baltimore. And he's also very much aware of his place in baseball history. He was going to be the hood ornament for the virtues of the town that was no more, for the virtues of the team that was no more. And Cal kept up his end of the bargain. They expect Cal to be that perfect exemplar of the perfect old Oriole way, even while there is no more Oriole way. It obviously became more in demand, and uh, he did have to retreat from that. And it was a shame that I think in, there was a period there where um, Cal wasn't enjoying the attention, and he did retreat. There's no question about that. He had to sign some autographs, and um, people were yelling at Cal, Cal, sign this, sign this, sign this, and there's one I think uh, a mother who was going, come on, Cal, come on, Cal, for my son. Be a good guy, be a good guy. He walked over really patiently, and, and he really didn't have time. He had, to, he had to go hit and said, you need to explain to your son that it doesn't make me a bad guy if I can't sign right now. I have to go hit, and I'm going to try to sign later, and, and walked away. As the consecutive games piled ever higher towards the Gehrig Summit, Ripken's celebrity produced repercussions in the Baltimore clubhouse. When I was struggling, they sent Greg Biagini, our hitting coach, to come work with me. When Cal struggled, Frank Robinson flew in, Brooks Robinson flew in. So he's standing there with these two Hall of Famers. I think there was a feeling that Cal had distanced himself from the team, and the other managers felt that at times that Cal had, se had separated himself too much and made himself a special case, staying in a different hotel. I think that caused some resentment. I think he sincerely believes, geez, I need my privacy, I need my time, I need my cocoon. 
uh, in which I can I can dwell. The first few times there there were limos waiting on him, and people kind of ragged him a little bit about it, and he didn't like that. So the next thing you know, there's these these catering vans, these courtesy vans, and and that would be what took him to the hotel. When Eddie Murray came back to the team. Right at the end of his career, teammates told me that Eddie was aghast at the idea that, that Cal had separated himself from the team. If there's a trade-off um, between Cal maintaining his privacy by staying in another hotel and arranging for his own rides, and then going to the ballpark and signing autographs for kids, then I think it's a pretty good trade. He's seen the value that he could give to the game by presenting the parts of himself accurately that would be conducive to that image and actually by kind of squashing uh, the smart ass side of himself. Yeah, Versa said he was a Versa. great low key guy. Yeah, great disposition, perfect disposition to break Gary Dragon just. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. As he pursued the record of a man whose image had been forever immortalized by Hollywood, Ripken remained who he was, at least off the field. Yep. It does a body good. When I wanted to interview him for my book, we met at a small little restaurant. And I remember that uh, Cal had not one, but two glasses of milk. And I'm just sitting there thinking, you know, this is pretty amazing. I mean, he really does drink milk. When people talk about, you know, like protective of his image, I think maybe sometimes people people are, are looking a little bit too sinister at what maybe is just reality. I don't think there's any question that the personality trait that enabled Cal to play every game, you know, 2,632 consecutive games, is also there in other parts of his life. A couple of his teammates used to say that, you know, they'd go to play basketball, they'd have to sign forms, you know, insurance forms, you know, that he's not liable if one of them got hurt playing basketball at his gym. Not that Cal was cheap, just the opposite, it's just that he was so meticulous. Everyone had to have his own water cup. For instance, he's an absolute type A personality. We were kind of new fathers together and what our kids were doing. And he mentioned one time after a bath, we were just kind of standing around, that he recorded everything that their new daughter was eating and and what she was passing through. And I, I said, you're doing what? And I said, you know, we're just feeding our kids. We don't, he goes, oh, he goes, yeah, we keep detailed records and everything. And uh, we kind of laughed about it. I mean, he, he thought it was kind of uh, rude for us laughing at him, but uh, I didn't know anybody else did that. Anytime you shook his hand, he makes eye contact with you. And if you don't make eye contact, he doesn't let go of your hand. It's not a joke. It, you know, I mean, sometimes he does it on, you know, on the bench. It's all, sometimes in fun, but there's some seriousness behind it. When uh, my mom or my sister would come back to a table in a restaurant, my dad would uh, tap us on the back, and we'd all have to stand up. And, and they would sit down, and we'd all sit down again. You sit there and you laugh, and the next thing you know, we went out a few times and you find yourself doing it. Cal Senior tried the best he could to make these guys, his sons, gentlemen. And a couple of times I showed some emotion on the mound, and I remember Cal Jr. getting me aside, said, that's just not how we do it. We don't do that here. And I began to change. I was a little emotional player when I was coming up in, in, through the minors, but I changed. I adapted to the way that the Orioles wanted to do it, and that was just almost in a robotic way. It's ironic that the press sees the stiff Ripken, but the public that sits around with him after the game and talks about, oh, I run a barbershop in Aberdeen, the fans that he signs those autographs for see the relaxed, loosey-goosey, funny Cal. It's almost worth going to get one of those lines for one of his autographs to talk to him to see the real Ripken. Ripken's relationship with the Orioles hierarchy cooled when his father was fired in April of 1988. There's some things that uh, have, have certainly rubbed him wrong about that year. Uh, Senior certainly did not get a fair shake. We lose 15 games more after Senior got fired and we're 0-21 to start the season. I've always believed that that's the reason why Cal Jr. would never embrace a lot of what the organization wanted to do. 
He always resented the way that the organization, whether it was past owners or current owners, the way that his father was treated. There's never been a manager and owner of the Orioles that at some point he hasn't told me exactly how he feels about them. But it's always deep off the record. There are people in that organization over the last 20 years that he has absolutely hated, and he simply does not see the point of bringing those things to the surface. When the 1994 World Series was canceled by Commissioner Bud Selig during a player's strike, the American pastime struggled to regain a diminished public respect. It became obvious that one of the few things that was going on in the game that was good for everyone was the streak. So Ripken finally figured it out. And it took him a while. All he would really say at the time was that he understood what his responsibility to baseball was at that point. That, that the streak had reached a point where it could be used to help baseball recover. Cal Ripken became the face of baseball. The strike, the public said, a pox on both your houses. Rich owners, greedy players don't like any of this. And along came this guy whose claim to fame to the average person was, he does what I do. If you want to say it was calculated, yes, because everything Cal does is calculated. But the fact remains, in the aftermath of the greatest labor cataclysm in the history of baseball, Cal decided that he was going to win the fans back one autograph at a time. During the season, he started this thing where he was signing autographs after the game. And there were many a nights when I left the ballpark. And if you drive down the side street of the ballpark, you can see into the ballpark. And there were many a nights where I saw people lined up down the left field line of the corridor as I was driving out at midnight and thinking to myself, how does this man do this? Uh, I remember the All-Star game that year in Texas. It was unbelievably hot, and Cal stood out there and signed autographs for two hours. Well, you look around, and there weren't other players doing it. To the fans, embittered by the acts of players and owners, Ripken's pursuit of Gehrig's record of 2,130 consecutive games burned with all the virtues that the sport once represented. As the days counted down to September 6th, the streak took on an almost spiritual dimension. In 1995, when he was getting closer and with each passing day, once we would play the innings at home, where it made it a legal ball game if we were ahead. Then they would drop off the warehouse a new number as we was getting closer, 21, 10, up the line. And that was magical. Amid the thickening nostalgia, Ripken rose to the occasion. He went five for nine with homers in games 2,130 and 2,131. It's a little sappy. The big star of the game, the hometown boy, you know, uh, sets Major League Baseball historic record and then hits a home run in the game. But that's what Cal Ripken did. It was amazing. And as I recall, he did it with a he did it with a temperature too. He was not feeling very well. He didn't let on. There were a lot of people walking around, you know, with a little bit of a tear in their eye, and it was, it was, kind of, it was a happening. It really was. And um, I saw Senior, you know, Senior had a little bit of a tear in his eye, and Senior didn't cry. He would actually speak to different fans as he went around the field. At one point, he got to the right field corner and actually leaped to high-five some people that he knew out there. And because he's Cal and everything had to be in perfect order, people were throwing things on the field. He'd actually reach down pick up this stuff and throw it back. Like he had to keep the field clean as he went around. I remember uh, the tears in when, I, when, in when I was interviewing players on the opposing team. The Anaheim Angels were there and uh, everybody was choked up. I guess you could say that uh, you shouldn't make such a big deal about a guy doing his job day in and day out. But we live in an age where not many players play a week in a row. Maybe he wasn't a 340 hitter with 140 RBIs every single year. 
But he didn't just break Lou Gehrig's record. He added 501 games to it. And he did it in a tougher position than Lou Gehrig played. So yeah, it's a big deal. And yeah, it's a very big deal to people in Baltimore. I know the first thing Davey Johnson, when he took over the Orioles in 1996, I walked into spring training, he says, now, of course, he's broken um, uh, Luke Eric's record, so, you know, the record's over. He goes, how am I going to get Cal to take a day off? It was clear to them that Cal was no longer a player in his prime, and that if they were going to compete, if they were going to win, there might be some days when the interest of the Orioles would be best served by someone other than Cal starting. Peter Angelos, the owner of the Orioles, was involved, uh, the manager, Davey Johnson, Pat Gillick, the general manager, myself, as well as Cal uh, near the end. Uh, but we felt like, uh, from a management perspective and ownership's involvement, we wanted to really analyze when would be the best time for this streak to end. Management's careful prodding of Ripken to take a day off wasn't the only thing threatening his routine. Davey Johnson had a prospect he wanted to try out at shortstop. I don't think there's any question that Davey Johnson had strong feelings about Cal. The fact that he tried to put Manny Alexander at shortstop and move Cal to third for one week, now it created a lot of problems. In May of 1996, Davey took Cal out for a pinch runner in the eighth inning and he put Manny Alexander in. Well, unbeknownst to Davey, uh, Cal had never been taken out of a game when the outcome of the game was still in doubt. Manny goes in and Manny's uh, impeccable timing got picked off within uh, five seconds and he ran back to the dugout and he sat down right next to Cal uh, and he's, he's tying up his shoes and Cal's sitting there with his arms folded in that great Roman nose and for seven innings as the game went into extra innings you could just see Cal's anger. He was just stewing over the fact he'd been taken out of the game. I know that Davey Johnson would have liked to have seen Cal Ripken take Manny Alexander more under his wing than he did. Um, Manny was, um, you could call him the heir apparent to Cal Ripken at one time as the shortstop in Baltimore and, and Cal just basically didn't give him the time of day. I think that talking about the shift from third, short to third uh, cleared a lot of air, air on the ball club because he was mad as a hornet at me, and I, rightly so, I guess. Uh, but that did clear the air because about an hour later after Cal really was mad at me, he said, Skip, you got a right to do whatever you want to do, whatever you think's best for the ball club. Although, he said, I don't think Manny's the guy to replace me in short. And he was 100% right. The Alexander Project lasted just six games before Ripken was reinstalled at shortstop in midseason. Although he finished with 102 RBIs, his range in the field appeared to have diminished, especially in the American League Championship Series against the Yankees. He's had problems throwing from the hole this entire series. In December of 1996, the Orioles signed Mike Bordick to play shortstop. Moving a few steps to his right, Ripken played the hot corner every game of the 1997 season. Despite experiencing back pains in 1998, Cal Ripken, at 38, still had not missed a start since 1982. On September 20th, before the Orioles' last home game, Ripken kept a promise he made to himself. The fingers would be pointed in all different directions, and the streak sometimes would be a focus of that. So at certain times, you had to manage it. You had to defend the basic, uh, the basic desire is to go out and play. In that particular season, it started to happen early in the season, and I just thought about it and said, you know what, if we fall out of this race, if we can't make the wild card, if there's no real purpose at the end of the season to play, I'm just gonna end the streak and, and start over next year. Well, the Orioles took the field, and look at this. He's not out there. And the Yankees, of course, noticed this. And Derek Jeter was outside the dugout taking practice swings, and he looks quizzically over at the dugout. He looks at Cal, and they make eye contact. Cal just sitting there. And all the Yankees saw what Jeter saw, and they, with Joe Torre, stood up on the top step of the dugout and just started to applaud. I know he was touched because you could see it in his eyes. Like he, but but it also was a big relief for him uh, because now he didn't have to battle that every single day again. You know, because he was hurting. 
He did it his way. He did it with amazing grace and dignity. There was not a, a controversy. There was not a problem. It was just, this is the way it's going to be. And it was perfect. He really handled that perfectly. Often it's uh, as relaxed as I've seen him in a baseball uniform, smiling, signing. He really looked relieved, like, it's over. I can kind of be a normal ball player now, you know? Because now I think he can let down his guard a little bit and just become normal like the rest of us. I didn't feel uh, a sense of uh, liberation. It just seemed uh, to be the right time earlier in the season. We have to understand there was a certain management of the streak all along. And I had to deal with that. Not because it was important to play in the streak and continue the streak. It was just the streak was formed. Managers put you in the lineup and the streak was formed. Six months after Ripken's streak ended at 2,632 games, a more solemn end hit the Ripken family. Cal Sr. succumbed to cancer at 63. Most of what he had been able to, to accomplish to that point, he'd been able to share with his dad. It had a big effect on Cal. He is still carrying on what his father did by doing the baseball clinics and teaching the so-called, quote, Ripken way of playing baseball. Losing his dad, it wasn't like he lost his dad. It was like he lost his best friend. And, and I know, in a sense, it devastated him. Whenever he went to the ballpark, his father was there. So they, they tell me when you lose a father that the way to get away from it is to go to your place of work and put your mind on your work. But the problem with Cal Jr. is going to work is where he always saw his father. But in 1999, Ripken was placed on the disabled list for the first time in his career. Although hitting a career-high 340, he appeared in only 86 games. Late that season, he underwent back surgery. However, the following year, the pain returned. He was on the DL for two months. Here's a guy who had been impenetrable physically. He's the Iron Man. He doesn't get hurt. And finally, something was happening. And I think that was the most difficult part of it for him initially. How do I deal with this? How do I get to the point where I can still play. On June 19, 2001, Ripken, who was hitting just 210, announced he would retire at the end of the season. Three weeks later, playing in his 19th All-Star game, he said goodbye to the nation. The man of a thousand stances leads off, rips one. Now was sort of, instead of a count up to something, it was going to be the count down. And uh, just in watching Cal on the field, it's almost as if he had renewed spirit that now he could just sort of go out and play. On October 6th in Camden Yards, Baltimore's favorite son took the field for the last time. He just said, you could write a whole book on why I like Baltimore. This is where my dad grew up. This is where I, this is the first team I cheered for. I knew all the old Orioles. There was such a dedication to his community through black and orange baseball that I think that tells you how much Cal Ripken appreciates baseball and appreciates baseball in, in Baltimore. How do I want to be remembered? To be remembered at all is pretty special. According to the 1995 schedule, Lou Gehrig's record would fall on September 6th, the last day of a Baltimore homestand. Baseball people held Cal Ripken in such esteem that they wanted to make sure nothing interfered with that date. Then in mid-August, rain threatened an Orioles game in Boston. Red Sox player rep Mike Greenwell, knowing that a postponement would mean that Ripken would pass the iron horse on the road, asked the Orioles star his thoughts. Ripken wanted no special treatment. The integrity of the sport is what mattered. As it turned out, the game was played and history stayed on course. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.